to bed Disappointed with myself Everything a little, nothing right I fall by the wayside Cause I've been treading water And I did not even bother Bumbling through I always took the easy way Until I went astray But now it's time I won't turn around No, I won't turn around Hello, everybody. Sorry for that delay. Um, we always have something that goes into the uh, like someone throws a wrench on this uh, cog, so to speak. Um, but we're here. We're ready. We're prepared now. Uh, let me introduce myself. I am Benjamin Ash of Sam Ash Music, and we do these regular live streams, not only in general, just with live streams in general, but we also have been doing these regularly with our friends from Steinberg and Cubase. So speaking of friends from Steinberg and Cubase, here is the very own Greg Ondo. Greg, welcome to the stream. Hi, good to see you, Ben. So for those that have never tuned into one of these, explain who you are, what your skill set is, what makes you a specialist, etc. cetera. Uh, so my name is Greg Ondo. I've been working with Steinberg for about 28 and a half years as a product specialist. So I just get to help people Kind of realize their creativity so whether it's composing music or you know what we're going to take a look at today it's kind of taking it across the finish line with some mastering tips so thank you for that and to uh piggyback on that notion greg also does his own regular series is it forgive me is it on the steinberg youtube channel or the just cubase? the cubase youtube channel so on the cubase youtube channel if you check him check it out he does these regular uh, kind of Google Hangout, YouTube Hangout type things where he'll ask you, he'll answer your questions. You can ask him anything, much like what we're going to do today. So I should preface by saying two things. One, ask us any and all questions because we are happy to answer. This is an interactive show. I'll be talking with Greg. Greg will be explaining things to me about, in this case, Wave Lab. And you, the audience, can ask whatever you'd like. It's awesome that we have almost 40 people tuned in, which is fantastic. So if you guys have any questions, just let us know whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, type your questions away. We'll pull them up on the screen and we'll answer them to the best of our ability. Greg probably doing way better than I would because I'm here to learn just like all of you. And um, that being said, we are discussing mastering techniques in WaveLab, hence the title. But there is something cool, which is the fact that we are giving away a full license to WaveLab. So if you want to enter that, just check the description in this video on either YouTube or Facebook. It'll have a link there. If you're having trouble, just let us know and we'll be happy to paste the link in the comments and pin it. So that way you can see it for yourself. Enter. We've gotten some people who've entered since we've announced this uh, live stream and they might win. You might win, but you won't know unless you try to enter. And there are multiple ways to enter after the simple initial entry. So you can visit certain websites, subscribe to places, and that'll give you bonus entries. So good luck to all those. And we'll be announcing a winner after the live stream commences, uh, or rather ends, forgive me. So without further ado, give us an overview of, first of all, what is WaveLab? How is it different from Cubase? How does it work with Cubase? So WaveLab is kind of the uh, mastering, and I kind of consider it more of a kind of delivery system. You know, a lot of programs and DAWs can, you know, people will think of it as being, oh, I, you know, throw some processing on a two track file or stereo mix and I'm mastering. But what WaveLab allows you to do is to really kind of take your recording and really take it to the next level, but also to deliver to multiple formats easily to, you know, create audio CDs or DVD audio and 
kind of when you're working, make your tracks that you created in Cubase. And it, let's say you're doing a, an album project to make sure that the album is consistent and homogenous sounding so that, you know, one track doesn't sound, you know, completely different than other tracks. So you have that cons consistency, which is something that's lacking in a lot of recordings. So that being said, um, because there are certain features that we're going to go into with WaveLab that I've seen just even th through thumbnails and even when we kind of talked about it in previous live streams. But it's not just necessarily for true musicians in the respect, because I understand there's also video capabilities that come with WaveLab and that in helping whether you're making a music video or whether you're scoring a film. So um, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get more into that. But can you just briefly explain how that works in general with WaveLab and why that WaveLab is a good resource for those that are looking to do those kind of projects? Yeah. So if you're doing, you know, like obviously during our pandemic era, you know, there's lots of people that are doing podcasting, you know, and you could think of WaveLab as just an audio editor. So there's lots of people who do work in WaveLab or they're extracting, you know, audio from a video file and they want to make it louder or, you know, be able to equalize it. But there's also a lot of like uses for, you know, investigational audio and forensic audio that are, that are really interesting. So, you know, while, you know, we often think of a DAW as more of a musical studio, you know, we could think of this as, you know, being just, you know, a, like a real Swiss army knife of, you know, audio editing and, you know, transformation. That's awesome. So I guess let's dive right to it. Um, so the basics with any kind of program like this would be editing. So everyone wants to know how would you edit, in this case, audio trimming and fades, normalizing pans. And for anyone who's even got a modicum amount of knowledge about anything with DAWs, you may know this in general, but we're going to show you how, at least in WaveLab, you can use it to the best of your ability. Yeah. So let's pull up the full screen so we can see what we're talking about. And Greg, take it away. Okay, and I'll just make sure you guys could hear just a little bit of audio there. Um, so when we look at, you know, most of us are pretty familiar with the paradigm and concept of audio waveforms, you know, so if we see them be taller, that, you know, generally indicates it's going to be louder, we could see that this is going to be more percussive, but sometimes dealing with your audio, you may want to actually look at it in different formats. So one of the ones you could do is, you know, we could see kind of a typical audio waveform that we see here, but we could also see a spectrograph, which would show us kind of the frequencies and the activity of the frequencies. And we could also see this in like a wavelet where this is going to be kind of more based on musical scales. So as we kind of look at this and we could also see kind of full loudness. And when we deal with stereo audio file, we could think of it as being the left right channel and that's pretty typical, but we could also look at it as the mid and side. So this is the content in this view that's in the middle part of the panning spectrum and this is gonna be on the side. So it gives you kind of an interesting perspective, but as we wanted to do typical editing functions. So I wanted to take this, and again, we often will do this as like once a file has been exported from a program like Cubase, now I may need to just kind of come over here. I wanted to do a fade in. I wanted to take this section of the audio and I just wanted to adjust the level, say down minus six dB. And we could do that a couple ways. So I'll just type in minus six. Um, and as we just, so or plus six, if I wanted this to do, um, you know, different functions like, okay, let's just, uh, adjust the gain, we'll say minus 12 dB for this section. I want it to delete this section of the audio, just add silence. Let's say, uh, you know, we want to do typical stuff like, okay, I just wanted to reverse that audio. So those are all pretty standard types of edits. But what makes WaveLab kind of unique is, you know, we have an edit history and we could have our unlimited levels of undo go back and unlimited levels of redo that we could see. But let's say I've done, you know, 400 edits at this point, you know, I, let's say I just want to undo this fade in just for this one without affecting all these in kind of a linear sequential manner. I could just double click and I will right click on here and just say, 
Um, I just want to restore the initial version. So I'm going to say restore the selected audio with the samples. And at this point, it'll just uh, go back and undo that one particular function as we do that. So that way my fade in is gone, but all the other edits are completely intact. So I don't have to lose, you know, my whole series of edits to recover one bad decision that I made earlier. Also, as we kind of, you know, want to take a look at, you know, some of the different functions, you may run into situations where, you know, maybe the left channel isn't as, you know, loud as the right channel. So you could actually just select different parts and you could go to like a pan normalizer. And at this point, you could just say, I want it by, you know, the peak levels or by the overall loudness. So we could just say apply. And then we could just make sure like the left and right channels are uniform between themselves. The thing that I found interesting, forgive me, I, let me rephrase that. So I love, because it kind of reminds me, I'm not familiar terribly with Photoshop, but I understand that it's almost similar to the idea of layers where instead of having to press control uh, Z or edit undo, that kind of thing, that like I've been stuck on projects where I realize I made a mistake. Forget if it's just a video or a photo project. Sometimes it's just a word processing problem where I've typed so many mistakes and then I want to undo and I try to undo as many as I can. And then it just says, nope, done. You can't undo do anything. You've already done it. So one thing that I love is that it's the fact that you can always save in this program without worrying if you can fix a mistake even after saving. Because usually when you save, that's it. You're done. No more edits uh, prior to that. So correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it's similar to Photoshop with the idea that it's not quite like layers in that respect, but that you can go to any specific edit and undo that thing you did. Yeah, we, were, we really wanted to make it kind of musician proof, you know. And that, you know, if you, you know, because, you know, you shouldn't be really bound by a decision you made early on, especially kind of in the mastering process, because the whole workflow is very dynamic. Especially if you're learning the program. Yeah. So, um, forgive me, continue on. You, you've been going into some audio trimming fades. Uh, but yeah, I, I love that, just that simple thing. But go on, don't let me stop you. Now, one of the things that's really interesting that a, a lot of people miss is you know what is actually kind of going on in the audio file itself so i could i'll just kind of select um even just a, a range of the file and we could do a global analysis of the file so and when we do this it's going to tell us exactly where our peaks are um you know where it is at the cursor we could also come over here and you know what the overall loudness is and this is kind of a, a big distinction that mastering engineers are working with so there's actually kind of a trend where you know we've had the, these volume wars for a long time and it ends up that a lot of times the you know when you're making something what you seem what you think is louder when it's played when it's being streamed or being played on a radio it's actually kind of fighting against the streaming algorithms so here you could actually deliver and see what the loudness is. And this is kind of how you can optimize your overall volume to be, you know, specifically optimized for different streaming engines or broadcast. We could also see, you know, what the pitch is, if there is a DC offset. A lot of times people have problems in their electricity in their room. And as they record audio, the, you know, there could be a DC offset that needs to be corrected. Um, so all these different analysis options are really critical. You know, I have a friend who's a mastering engineer, uh, and he's notorious for calling up like, you know, the great mixing engineers, cause he'll do a DC offset and he's like, you know, and, and he could determine, he's like, yeah, did you know that your, you know, one of your wires on your reverb was out of phase and I could figure it out by looking at it in wave lab, you know, and they're like, oh, he was right. And it got through the whole process. So the, these types, being aware of the different functions uh, can be really critical to know where to start, you know, how much gain you have you know, left from the project that you received. So those are really important aspects to work with. And when you kind of move a bit further on, 
with analysis, you know, we could come over here and just see, you know, our 3D frequency analysis. So this is, it's often called a fast Fourier transient display. Um, the, the thing that's important is it just looks cool. Um, you know, so if you have to like, you know, if, if someone is paying you in your studio, you know, you could just pull this up and just kind of rotate it around and go, ah, oh, yeah. Oh, check that out. Oh, mm. oh, that's what we had to fix right there. But what this is, is basically okay, a three dimensional cool. view of, I was just yeah, of your I frequencies right. and time. It just looks really cool. Just showing that off. Like yeah. this is a fun party trick. But that's wild that you get a 3D mapping of all of that. Mm -hmm. So you'd see exactly kind of, you know, what exact frequencies that you're working with. And kind of moving on from there, you know, one thing that's also very critical and what we see a lot of people use WaveLab for is just metering and, you know, the different metering options that are available in WaveLab. So as I play back a particular project here, um, we have different meters up top. So if I wanted to, let's say as I play, I could see frequency meters here. I'll just jump back in my song. We can see kind of our dB meter. So we can see exactly how much headroom we have left. We see these as peak. And then we have our RMS meters. If I wanted to see this as loudness units for optimizing for streaming, we could see kind of waveform. And this is like an actual kind of real time Fourier display. So like a frequency display that we see going on here. I can see different spectrometers. So all these meters are just kind of included directly in with WaveLab. We also have a phase scope. And this is a term that people, you know, often will, you know, not quite understand. So when we have, and we hear kind of the, the term phase a lot, but you know, if we actually, let's say, and when we look at this a waveform, we can see that, you know, both of these files will kind of go up and down in a waveform at the same time. And that makes it sound kind of more full. But when I invert the phase of my right channel here, I could just say, let's just invert the phase. That will basically do the opposite effect. So as we play, I can see my phase scope get to be very much kind of vertical. And if we undo that, you could see how kind of wide that the phase scope will actually get as well. So this allows you to find different phase anomalies. So, you know, I still see lots of studios that pay, you know, a lot of money to have meters, but all these meters are really just kind of a part of WaveLab. And that's what makes it so powerful. And again, it looks cool, you know, and when you have clients there, you know, they tell you really good information but it's great eye candy and it makes it more engaging to work with. Well, that's what's also great is in lieu of that is you were saying like, if you're working with a client who sometimes the client will be like this behind you in the room, making sure you're doing everything right. And instead of having to, no offense, Greg, I'm sure sometimes you're like, okay, how do I explain this in words? So it's not incredibly convoluted and complicated and going over their head where you can supplement that by showing them, the meters and everything and be like, see how this is moving. We want it to move like this. See how this is this color. We want it to be more like this color. So exactly. it's paint by numbers for people who are not at, like, cause that's the thing is you're the engineer or the producer or the master. And some of these guys come into the studio and they're like, I know what I'm talking about. And I want to like this for my client. Cause my client deserves the best. And sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and be like, yeah, okay, let me try to explain it to you. But this makes that conversation a lot easier to swallow and be able to help them out. So it is great when there's a computer program for something like music mastering or mixing that, again, makes it super easy to understand, including myself, who usually this stuff goes right over my head. 
So uh, awesome that this program can do that. Yeah. Do you want to check to see if there's any, are there any questions we could answer before we move on? Uh, so far, we have a very quiet chat. And I, I refuse to believe there are 26 plus people out there simply watching who have zero questions. I mean, heck, I have questions and I'm saying stuff and I'm just hosting this show. But guys and gals and any, any identity that you belong to, please ask questions because I only have so many. And again, I'm not a master at this. So there are questions that are probably above my knowledge of this that I would never think to ask. And Greg is at, Greg loves the challenging questions because he either knows how to answer them or if he doesn't, he will find an answer for them for you ASAP because it's Greg's job to know this program inside and out. So, ooh, okay. We've got a question. Someone, see, it's we're, we're not shy here. We're here to mm-hmm. help you out. But Andy's got a question. He's curious. At some point, could you demonstrate the external editor support in version 10? Well, I believe you are using version 10, correct? Yeah. So would you be able to demonstrate the external editor support? I don't think I actually have that. I, I could talk about it, but I don't have it configured, actually. So I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, but what it allows you to do is, you know, if, like there are very specific tasks. Like if you wanted to do more like spectral based editing, that will allow you to, you know, and like we, we also distribute, you know, and market spectral layers. Um, and what that will allow you to do is at this point, we could choose to I'll just kind of show you conceptually what it does. So, you know, again, this view, when we look at it is, you know, our frequencies. So if you had to have like a very specialized task, um, so say I just have, So let's say I just wanted to get rid of that vo- that vocal part. So what is, you know, the external editor will allow you to do is, you know, and this is a common one that we have kind of in conjunction with spectral layers is you could just select, you know, particular frequency ranges and say, you know what, I didn't like that. Uh, and at this point, you could just say, I just wanted to, you know, quickly be able to filter and cut those out. So and that's just kind of a super quick edit what? that you could do. Okay. So if you have like a guitar, like, you know, and this is kind of classic, you know, in spectral layers, which we could configure, um, will, you know, and it's like perfect for like, you know, a squeaky acoustic guitar, you know, someone slides their fingers here, you know, that squeak, you know, and sometimes it's like, Oh, it sounds so authentic, but it still doesn't sound good. <laughs> You know, so at that point, you could just say, you know, this is the squeak of the guitar. And I could just take out those frequencies without affecting the other frequencies. So that allows you to do like kind of surgical frequency repair. So that's when we could go into like, you know, an external editor for very particular functions like that. But this is great because especially I've dabbled in doing at least mashup stuff. And it can be very hard to find acapellas or instrumentals. Now, granted, you have to own the rights to the music. But if you were to, again, like you said, you just want to take out vocal parts, you just want to take out instrumental parts. I know there are lots of workarounds you can use with different apps, but you just showed us how to do that kind of stuff super easy and super quickly and super cleanly in some cases. Yeah, and spectral layers. Spectral layers is kind of ridiculous that you could take a full mix and say, take the drums out, take the vocals out, take the bass out, take the piano out and isolate it like that. I mean, it's like, you know, it's it's kind of voodoo magic stuff. Uh, And maybe we could show that on a future uh, session just on spectral layers. But that Yeah, that'd be great for a remixing kind of thing. But we're here to talk about mastering. So as cool as that feature is, let's make sure we have room to talk about all the cool features about mastering. Because if, again, the great thing about these kind of live streams is we want to give you all the tools so that in a time where it may be difficult to get to the studio or uh, hire an engineer or producer or someone to master, hopefully these are the tools that you can figure out how to do it yourself. Because heck, I know I'm trying to figure all this out. I probably am going to do a terrible job on my own. That's why I talk to people like Greg, because he's a pro at this. But um, to be an everyman in this respect, or an every woman or an every whatever, every dog even, 
if you can do this. That's the goal of these sessions is to be able to learn these skill sets so that you can at least, if not do it for yourself, be able to have this conversation with people in the studio and actually know what you're talking about. That's very important. So very cool with that free that um, it almost, it's funny. It looks like something you would see in a doctor's office, this kind of. Yeah. Well, what you're seeing here is actually kind of the harmonic overtone series. Wild. Th this is the, the overtone series visualized. So that's just that voice. And you see the harmonics, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth order harmonics. So, so cool. All right. Now, now one thing that people oh, will sorry. use this for also is, you know, we could run through you know, like ridiculous plugins. So let's say I just have uh, one of the plugins that we have is just a, one called Restore Rig. And what this is going to allow me to do is, you know, I could do de-clicking, denoising, debuzzing, because a lot of times you may just have like a live recording and someone, you know, their guitar amp and had their single coil pickups wide open, or you just have hiss on a recording, say something like this. Let's turn this up a little bit. So I could just kind of just eradicate the hiss that easily so we'll just And, you know, if you have like the noise isolated, it could actually do an analysis and learn that noise floor and be able to just kind of extract that directly out of the file. So, you know, so many times when we have people that are doing archiving and, you know, one of the big users of WaveLab is Library of Congress. And they actually, you know, are archiving no every recording that they have. And they've been doing this for years in WaveLab. So that, you know, like the very first recording of, you know, Thomas Edison that's been digitized and archived using WaveLab as well, well as every other recording. And you want to master all the classic rock albums that were made in the studios. Like if you listen, I, I can't say for certain they use WaveLab, but if you listen to some of the Beatles remasters, obviously the older tracks will have a bleed of hiss because they were basically using a, like a practically, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like one of the first gen four track recorders, which didn't yeah. acknowledge hiss. It was just, you were lucky to get sound. Yeah, so, it's pretty Dolby, everything. Yeah. Right, exactly. So now we're talking about taking those old sound, uh, all, I say sounds, but old tracks, old songs, old recordings of pretty much anything in history and making it sound like it was recorded today, especially a lot of classical. If you listen to classical music, either on a record or some other place, it's going to inevitably have hiss. And now that I speak and I'm saying this all out loud, I think it's very cool the idea that you can take, because I know some people will record records. They'll take a vinyl record and Im export it into their computer because some records were never produced on a different medium outside of a physical vinyl record. And now one of the problems you would have is if you recorded it, you'd get the pops and the crackles and the hiss of those records or the song itself, like again, classical music has that hiss because the recording technology back when they were recording that was eh. So now, yeah, you, and the engineers did the best they could, but it was just yeah. the nature of the medium. Exactly, it was you were like trying to. It's like trying to make. How do I make it? Like play an Xbox game on a Nintendo. It's impossible. So, or I should say, like a Nintendo, Nintendo. But I digress. The point I'm saying is, if you have records for example and you want to take the pops and the cracks and the hisses out wave lab could be your solution but that goes for any old recording that if you have fun mastering because i know some people all they love to do is remaster video and audio footage of things they love so mm -hmm. wave lab clearly if it's be, if library of congress endorses this in a sense it's a pretty darn good program call me crazy i would say they have the budget to have a purpose-built tool but they didn't need to Right. But they're saving, they're archiving the best of the best in our lives. So, understand. Exactly. So, that's very cool how stupidly simple it is to de hiss in the point where it's literally this on your computer and that you can even have this algorithm that'll learn it. So, arguably, 
if he goes, oh yeah, I get it. This is where you want the hiss. Let's do that for the entire track or the entire album. So very cool. Yeah. Um, now, a lot of people, you know, think of mastering as just kind of making your tracks louder. And, you know, there's kind of a fair, you know, that could be a fair statement. But let's say I just wanted to come here and I wanted to take a track to the next level. So let's say I have like a rock track, maybe. Let's have a good time. So we could have, you know, a, a whole series of plugins. And these plugins could be hardware based or software based. Uh, but one of them that's really in one of the concepts that's interesting is in mastering. A lot of times, you know, we, we think of left, right, but we have to also think of the mid and side. So you may have to do processing on just, you know, like a, let's say you have a, a two track mix and you, you know, the snare and vocal are just too hot. You may have to kind of just do processing on just the middle part of the panning spectrum. So not the edges. So I could come over here for each of the plugins. We could pick exactly where that plugin is going to do processing. Is it just going to be in the mid, just the left channel, the right channel, just in the sides, or is it going to be stereo? So you could decide where that processing will take effect. One of the plugins that comes included um, is a beast of a plugin called Master Rig. Um, and this is actually a combination of different mastering processes. So instead of having to run, you know, eight different plugins, we could just run kind of multiple mastering processes here. So if we want to say, okay, we're just going to look at a particular, um, so just turning this on. So when we look at this, we, you know, we could do stuff like, okay, I want to take this band of EQ and we can put it on a listen mode. And as I just, so I'll just put this on here. So as I just listen to this, as I move the parameter, that's all I'm hearing is what I'm adjusting. Then I get when I release, I hear it in context. So what are you keying in like your ears? Are you listening to try and fix the snare, the hi hat? Which specific part again? Um, this is like you know, like this band I could use for a guitar. You know, let's say. Out, and if I bypass that band, the, the, road, the guitars ride, will kind of disappear. But what's kind of cool about this is each band, you know, I was just talking uh, with, a, you know, a famous piano uh, performance artist today. And one of the things that they loved about this EQ is they could say, you know, in a piano, you use like left and right uh, mics for the piano. But a lot of EQs are just stereo. But you may want to EQ the left channel uh, where like, you know, maybe the bass is. You may want to cut that. And the right, right channel. These are different. Yeah you could boost that. So you could have independent frequency ranges as you work with that. Um, and if I wanted to also, you know, have like a multiband imager saturation, I wanted tube or tape saturation. I wanted to have, you know, different limiters. We could come over here and, you know, just have all these different mastering processes um, just go, you know, directly right where we were. And at that point, you know, just kind of really take it to the next level. So let's say if I just wanted to bypass a couple of these. Um, now, one of the dilemmas with mastering is, you know, does it sound better because it's better or does it sound better because it's just louder? And this is kind of a really hard thing to work with. So if I have this plug-in, and when this plug-in is turned on, the gain is going to increase. But we don't know if the actual EQs made a difference or we're just kind of fooling ourselves. So we have this concept of what's called the smart bypass. So at this point, I could choose to listen to the original audio file. Gonna roll. We got no control in the road. 
Then I could listen to the processed file. So I go back to the original. And what I could do is listen to the original at the same volume with the processing. So that way we're not tricking ourselves by just, you know, saying, wow, it sounds great because it's louder. We could have the same volume as the original file with the processing, kind of the sonic, you know, additions that we've added, but making sure that that is working at the same way. So that way we don't fool ourselves to kind of lying about what we're hearing. Right. Very cool. Yeah, that's, I mean just from the editing and, and effect processing, it's a lot. Like there's just the idea that what I love about what I'm hearing is it's very nuanced. The little things that you're just kind of like, well, I got to deal with it is instead of, no, we've got you covered. Like just that piano thing with the left and right uh, stereo situation that you can have independent EQs for each microphone for each part. So rather than recording it as one instrument, because it's a piano you're recording sides of the instrument to really balance out the sound of the keyboard or the piano i should say yeah. so there's little nice things that to every question you may have you could you could delve deeper but on the surface it's a it's an arguably easy to understand program yeah now when we're doing this let's say if i needed to apply you know these these processes to this you know at this point I could render these files. So I'll just click on render here and I could render it to just a selection. But one of the cool things is we could actually just set up a kind of a multi render. Um, so if we wanted to, we could just say, you know, I want it to, you know, as we render this file, we could say, you know, I wanted to, you know, do, you know, single output, but I could say I wanted to render to an MP3, a 24-bit 48K wave, a 24-bit 96K, a 16-bit 44.1, and you could choose different file formats. And then when you render and just choose start, it would automatically just output, you know, 10 different file formats. And that's kind of one of the problems with mastering now is because you know, what you master for CD could be different than what you do for HD tracks, different than wow. Amazon, different than iTunes, different than Spotify. So this way, when we render, it could automatically just incorporate all those different elements. And as we do this, one of the things that's a challenge is, you know, you may render a file, you know, for, you know, an MP3 or an AAC file for a particular section. You're like, oh, okay. And then it sounds different. You know, because the rendering engines all sound a little different. So we give you a plugin that's called the encoder checker. So what you're able to do is just say, you know what, for this, I want it to be uh, iTunes. And I wanted this one to be an MP3. Uh, so let's we'll say this is what's going to be used for, um, you know, Amazon Music or whatever. And this is my file that I'm using for, and you could create your own different file formats. And as you listen to your project, you know, I could come here and just listen to it and how it's going to be sounding in iTunes versus an MP3 at that resolution oh, and an MP3 at 128K. So I don't have to do, you know, I know what it's going to sound like beforehand. So I don't render and say, oh, you know, the hi-hats came out a little bit too much in this one. That's I can... great. Yeah, because I can't tell you how many times I've exported a project only to find out I have to export it another seven times because I missed, messed something up. Yeah. So it's nice to have a little preview of exporting. Um, before we move on, though, suddenly we have lots of questions. And right. I figured we'd tackle some of them. Sure. So, for example, Andy simply wants to know... Uh, if we can incorporate tracks into the audio montage, we are going to get to montage, but that'll be later. Yeah, in we're just about ready to get into montage. So maybe we'll get into that. Perfect. Just so, um, Perfect segue. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is getting cut off, but it says I've used WaveLab to digitize LPs, bringing in the audio at 88.2 kilohertz and 24 bits 
and reconstructing the running order with proper track spacing and the audio montage. So very cool. So he's using audio montage to digitize LPs. Mm, and by great. the way, if you go crate digging and you look for some records, like I've got some old comedy albums that have never been put on anything else before. So definitely do some crate digging, find stuff you can't find on Spotify because that's what's great about records. Um, here's a very simple question, but it, I'm sure there are differences. Edgar wants to know, what is the difference between Pro WaveLab Pro 10 and WaveLab Elements 10? So with WaveLab Pro, that's going to feature uh, more tracks in the audio montage, which we'll look at. It's going to have uh, more capabilities for plugins. So it's going to have more capabilities for like the master rig and the restore rig. Um, and it won't also do the spectral editing. So that's one of the differences. That those are some of the main differences between them. But you know, the WaveLab Elements is a great, uh, you know, phenomenal plugin or a phenomenal program to use. And I would I would imagine that you can easily uh, update from if you were to purchase Elements, it's an easy update to Pro. Just pay extra. And yeah, follow. exactly. All right. So look, if you're a little overwhelmed by anything in Pro, always start with Elements. Give it a try. But if you want to just dive right in, you're looking at pro. That spectral analysis thing alone is something that I feel like everyone would want. Um, and probably if oh, you enter in, that might might be a good idea to to enter in a contest. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. You Never hurt. Free. So um, awesome. So you were saying that we might just start getting right into montage. Is there anything you wanted to talk about just in case about editing, analysis, if effect? I think, yeah, I anything? think we'll move on to the montage. And right, we can always go back. Yeah. So All let's right. kick it. What's going so on? I'm just going to. So the montage is kind of more of an editing environment. And this is where people would often kind of, uh, you know, get their files ready for CD. So um, I'll just kind of come over here. So let's just say we'll do a new montage. Okay. And I'm just going to import some audio files. So I'll just take these audio files. Uh, so I'm just going to open up. Let's say these are all the songs on my upcoming EP. Um, so we can now look at them and just switch over the view here. Let's say, so we'll have this as kind of our montage. So our montage allows us to take multiple clips of audio and we can, you know, move them around freely. So if we want to do crossfades, you know, do real-time crossfades between different clips. Um, so as we want to kind of work with this, you know, so we could think of this as being, you know, our different tracks. So of our CD. So, you know, we can see this will be maybe track one. Going into track two. Now, if I needed to, like, let's say I run into a problem. I actually ran into it on this particular project I mastered, where if you kind of look at the levels between the left and right channel, you can see that the left channel is like, you know, significantly louder than the right channel. And I think what happened, I didn't get quite the perfect straight answer, is that the engineer who mixed it had their right speaker volume adjusted differently than the left speaker. So it sounded perfect in their room, but when you put this on a CD or in a car, it's not going to make too much sense. So at this point, we could actually, you know, if I need it to jump back into like the other editor, I could just say, let's just edit the source. And one of the great editing features that you could do is a thing called a pan normalizer. So I'll just come over here and I'll just say, I want to equalize the left and right channels you know, by peak or by loudness. And I'll just say apply. And now we can see that those, the left and right channels are going to be just completely kind of equalized now. So like a big problem just solved. So when we look at our material here, we may notice that we have different volume levels and this level of consistency can be really tricky to work with as well. Um, and I see this a lot, you know, where people work on their album, you know, they work on 10 songs and they work on it and they, 
you know, they go to Sam Ash and they buy new equipment with, you know, over the process of their working on it. And then it's like, oh, um, and their mixes sound inconsistent and they sound different. And usually you can tell which song was finished last because it sounds better. Um, and they've learned through the process. But we may run into different things where, okay, I want to have a consistent volume level between all these tracks. So at this point, I, I'm just going to select this. We could open up what we call a meta normalizer. And I will choose that I want to match the loudness of the active clip here. And then I hit apply. And this will basically just take all the files and make them the same consistent volume as that one clip. And people spend you know, hours and hours trying to do this. And now you could just, you know, one mouse click solve one of the biggest dilemmas in mastering. What's crazy to me is that these are problems I didn't know existed again. I'm a novice to all this. And I went from being, I don't know how this works to, oh my God, that is a problem to, oh, thank goodness, there's a way to solve that problem. <laughs> yeah. So... That's what's amazing about this. And forgive me if you can hear my squeaky chair through this. Like, it is just the squeakiest chair that I have. Um, but, yeah. I love it. Greg, this is such in the Halloween spirit. Because first you scare us. And you're like, oh no, this is a problem. And then you say, don't worry about it though. And then we all have a sigh of relief. Because Wave Lab is here to the rescue for those that are mastering. So thank you, Greg, for your service in that respect. There's, um, there's a lot of developers at Steinberg make it easy for me to look good. So there you go. See, I'm glad you're at least giving credit to where credit's due. Yeah. Um, so forgive me. I didn't mean it. I just want to interject and say thank you for making life yeah. easy for us with that one simple thing that we all take for granted. <laughs> now, let's say like sonically, like I listened to this track. Um, so let's say this one. All right. So let's say I listened to this one. So we just listen to kind of like how bright it is, you know, how dark it is. And I listen to this one. And this one is a lot brighter, as is this one. And we go to this one. So sonically, very different. Almost like AM radio versus FM radio in the old days. So we have an included plug-in called uh, Curve EQ. And this is by uh, nice folks at Voxengo that it's included with Wave Lab. So I'll just put this back in and we'll start from scratch. So what this is gonna allow me to do is to basically take a sonic fingerprint of the particular file. So I'm gonna put this into average mode. I'm gonna just play this file here, or one that's a bit darker. With the way my life turned out. And once we see the lines, the frequency up. curve just kind of settle in. I wonder how different I feel. We can stop, and then I'll say that's a take. And then I'll go to one of the other songs here. And she ain't you. So we see a different frequency response. So that kind of settled in. So I'm going to say, that's a take. So I'm going to say, I want to, you know, use the second file as the reference and apply it to this and then just match the EQs. So now on this file, so we just wanted to bypass. So where we were. So if you have those kind of sonic you know, audible differences between tracks. And it's really hard, especially if you're working on projects, mixing them, different studios, different people, to have that kind of consistent tonal characteristics between the tracks. Wave Lab can solve that problem for you as well.
Forgive me. I'm tuning back. Now, if I wanted to run, talk. okay. No, no, I'm just saying. If you, if it takes me a second to get back in, it's because I'm clicking a bunch of stuff. So, okay. Uh, but I understand. Me, continue on. So, and let's say you know you may have to run plugins just on a master section or just on a clip or just a selection. So I could come right over here and just say, okay, I wanted to listen. Yeah, I wanted, uh, you know, these plugins just on a clip, on the track, or directly on the output. And at this point, I could just say, oh, I want to see it on the master section and have plugins there. Now, many times in mastering, one of the things we want to do is to, you know, have reference tracks. So you take a recording that you trust that, you know, that, you, you know, is like kind of maybe in the same genre. And then you wanted to compare that, you know, to what you're doing. So I could, I'm going to click on the little plus sign here and we could add a reference track. So I will just insert a quick audio file here. Um, let's see if I... So say I just wanted to import this file. Now, one of the dilemmas with this is once you have a master track that this often goes through the same exact processing that you're using on your track to make it sound like the, the reference track. So this kind of gets processed twice. So it's like, you know, having something that you cooked twice that only needed to be cooked once. So it's going to taste different. It's going to sound different. So as we want to just, you know, at, and now that it's set up as a reference track, I could play it and we click on the little ear icon. That so I can say, this is my reference track and just one click. Same. I'm listening to that. Here's my reference and it's bypassing all of the processing in the master effects chain. And that way, without any delay, you could just, you know, have your reference track and be able to, you know, make your decisions based on a reference track to make sure you're not, you know, going off into the weeds. So you're actually hearing, you know, something that you're used to, you know, pretty, you know, that's a known reference. You could utilize that without having to come over here, turn off all the plugins, listen to it, you know, adjust your dithering, adjust different components. Just simply have your reference and one mouse click, be able to utilize that directly from, you know, your montage. So while that's a great feature, what I'm a little lost personally on real world applications where you would compare your song to like, what would be a situation where someone would say, okay, I need to compare this to this song? You know, people are always like, oh, make my song sound like Drake. Oh, okay. And then yeah, you put a Drake cool. file as your reference. And then, you know, you could listen to their file versus Drake. And it's like, hey, you know, if you wrote like him, that would help. Uh, <laughs> you know, or, you know, I want to sound like, you know, Sergeant Peppers. I want to sound like Boston. I wanted to sound like Steely Dan, you know just, you know, or, or Alison Krauss, you know, just like really, you know, great recordings. And then, you know, because it's a very typical thing, you know, clients go, make it sound like this. This is what I, you know, I love this sound, you know, do, deliver this for me. And that's what the reference track allows you to do very easily. Got it. Okay. Plus, it, it, now that I think about it, it might also be good if you want to compare just how you're, like, if you're going from one song to the next on, say, an EP, you don't want the levels to be off on one song or another, or maybe they just, you want it to sound like a cohesive album you created. Yeah. So that might also be another good use for that. Exactly. Cool. Um, all right. Before I know we're going over, cause again, we started late. I just want to make sure it was, I'm sure we've got a lot more to cover. Is there anything you want to make sure? We I think cover? we'll just get kind of get into maybe one more little part. Um, and just before you get into that, a reminder that all those watching, Please ask your questions because after this, yeah. we're hoping to answer your questions and announce the winner of Wave Lab, whoever gets that full license. So, uh, Greg, take it away. Okay. So, what I want to do now is I'm just going to we'll create a new montage from scratch. So, I'll just say new montage. And we still have, you know, people that, you know, sell CDs. And, you know, everyone, a lot of people think CDs are completely dead. It's, you know, it's really not the case for a lot of parts of America, you know, they buy CDs at Cracker Barrel, you know, and it's, you know, 
So, and it's still a great medium to have. So I will just, let's say, I will just insert some tracks here from scratch. And I have these in my montage and they're all kind of lined up. And if I want to make a CD, we click on the CD tab up top here. And under functions, we'll just say, let's go to our CD wizard. This will automatically put all of the Red Book CD markers. Uh, by default, we'll add two seconds of pause between each track. You can put in your UPC codes. And once I do this, um, you could enter in all of your different metadata. So if you want to put in CD text, uh, you know, also all of the metadata for particular tracks, you know, if you want to change the order of your CD. Uh, and when you're ready to, you know, you could burn the CD, but what's also important is the ability to make a DDP image. And if you're sending this to a record label, to a mastering, you know, for, you know, a CD district, you know, a manufacturing company, you know, this is the file that they want. And this is often cost a lot of money to have in other mastering programs. But at this point, you could just deliver a DDP image. And at that point, all of the metadata for your CD will be just included. So you could do digital release, you know, and again, with the, you know, with the multi render, you know, burn a CD, do, you know, six different types of MP3s, three different types of AAC files, high resolution, FLAC files, all of this in kind of one mouse click to take everything that you've done to improve the audio and to deliver and be able to distribute it and realize revenue from it. There we go. That is great. I'm so glad that you can do that. And it's so weird to hear the phrase burning a CD because I'm sure there are people at least 10 years younger than me that are watching this and going, what does that mean? Yeah. Do you have to create a bonfire? Like <laughs> I had this conversation with someone, they were like, what's burning mean? And I'm like, oh boy, that made, I'm 32 and that made me feel old. <laughs> um, yeah, if anyone has any more questions, we're about to wrap this up. Yeah. So, oh, here's someone, Andy saying, can you check the DDP image with the included DDP player? Yeah, so with WaveLab, you get a DDP player as a as a standalone program. And it used to be like you'd have to have WaveLab installed. But if you, um, now it's just a freely available utility, so anyone can play it. So a lot of times what happens now is a mastering engineer will just, you know, send, you know, put a DDP file on, like Dropbox, and then they say, download the Steinberg DDP player. And that way they could monitor, listen to it, and you know give any feedback without having to physically burn a disk and have the, you know, the disk be a variable in that. So yeah, you could use the included DDP player with WaveLab, and it's just freely available. Awesome. All right. So all that being said, this has been incredibly informative. And um, yeah, so let's definitely check out who won this incredible prize. Because remember, you've just seen most of the features. And if you have any questions once you win this, Greg does these on uh, the Cubase YouTube channel. I don't know if you focus solely on Cubase or you delve just into whatever way. anyone asks. Beautiful. So. so you may have more questions and then some about WaveLab. But without further ado, I've already picked a winner during this live stream. Uh, I'm not going to make you do a drum roll. I'll do my own drum roll because I know WaveLab doesn't necessarily have drum plugins or anything. Yeah. So the winner of WaveLab 10 full license goes to Alex Laboda. Congratulations. All right. You've won a full license. So I hope you enjoyed the live stream as it is. Um, and also, I hope you enjoy your new license for WaveLab. And congratulations! Yeah, it's it's look. Greg knows this is a great program. I just learned about it, and it's awesome. So, uh, yeah, you're gonna get WaveLab, and you're gonna have a blast making some great masters of stuff. Like, um, who was it that said that? Like Andy Baum was saying that he does this to master all his LPs. So that's a great idea for you guys. Um, in any respect, 
Thank you guys for tuning in. Oh, that's nice of you. Look at you, Jason. That's the spirit. You may have not won, but he, even he's saying congratulations. Oh, very nice. Yeah, there you go. Got to show some positivity. So, um, again, if you have questions, I'll stall for time because I, myself and Greg usually do our little pitches at the end and our little plugs at the end. Uh, so I'll go first to kill some time because goodness knows I can do that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who has watched this session today because these are always fun for us. And thank you for everyone who's entered. Thank you for everyone who's watched. Thank you for everyone who shops at Sam Ash Music. And speaking of shopping at Sam Ash Music, you can go uh, visit us at samash.com. You can visit us in store. And speaking of in store, we have been consistently keeping our stores clean and hygienic. We wipe down every surface that someone so much as walks by, let alone touches. We clean every instrument that's picked up and played. And we also clean it before it's picked up and played. So you feel safe. We also, if you're not still not comfortable coming physically into a store, but want to shop at a Sam Ash location, you can still do so because we do offer curbside assistance. Just call the store up in advance, explain what you want, pay over the phone, or go to the store and give them your card. Either way, we'll figure something out and we'll get the product to you ASAP. Uh, you can also call us at 1-800-4-SAM-ASH to speak to a representative who not only will help you find the stuff you that you're looking for, but can also help explain the gear you're purchasing, explain additional accessories that can help you find exactly what you're looking for. So that way you have the best musical experience because we want to make sure that the only questions you have coming back to us is either ones to inform you of how the gear works uh, along with what you know. And what else can I get from you guys? We don't want if there, and look, if anything happens that you're not thrilled with, we accept criticism. We're okay with that. That makes us a better company by hearing what you guys are upset about and doing better. Hopefully it's not too much that you're upset about, but we still acknowledge all that. And we also love comments that are good. Uh, all that being said, um, one last thing. Uh, oh, this is great. Andy saying, been shopping at Sam Ash since I was a kid. The store on Utica Ave in Brooklyn, back when your great grandma Rose worked the cash register. Wow, that's wild. Wow. So thank you for being a longtime customer, Andy. See, there you go. Andy's one of our OGs. Some people say they've been shopping with us forever. Andy's probably been shopping with us forever if my great grandma Rose mm -hmm. sold him something. So legitimacy goes to him. Um, all of my speaking, though, being said, Greg, is there anything you'd like to mention as far as Steinberg Cubase about your live streams, anything in general? You know, you can check out, we, we're always doing, you know, live streams <clears throat> on the Cubase channel, but there's a dedicated WaveLab channel with tutorials. And, you know, I've been fortunate, you know, ever since I started my career, like, you know, a long time ago, you know, 28 and a half years ago, you know, I always, you know, look forward to going to, you know, cover Sam Ash stores when I was in my territory and they're always really great stores. <clears throat> so, you know, take advantage of having that knowledgeable <clears throat> retail staff available uh, that can really kind of set you straight. And, you know, for companies that take the time to educate your customers with these live streams, it's a wonderful resource to, to offer. Awesome. Yeah. And thank you for saying that, Greg, that really means a lot. Checks in the mail, jokes aside. Um, no, that's really nice of you to say, cause we, We've been around for almost 100 years and we try to have the best reputation possible in this industry to make sure that everyone who's on their musical journey has what they need, gets what they need, and that we can inform and be a big part of their life. So if we can do that, that's a great thing. So uh, without further ado, again, congratulations to, I believe the name was Alex. I just don't want to, yes, Alex Loboda. Congratulations once again. Greg, thank you so much for teaching us all about mastering techniques and wave lab and i'm looking forward to the next steinberg live stream we do when that is what that covers and also if you guys want feel free in the comments to say what kind of steinberg cubase wave lab thing you want to learn about and maybe we'll do a whole topic about it maybe it's maybe we'll dive deep into one specific feature maybe we'll talk about a certain way to mix um and yeah Either way, uh, we'll see you next time. Greg, again, thank you so much. And to all of our customers, thank you so much for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.